Masco. Um, for the last two years, I've been a professional uh, facilitator, trainer, and coach, occasional consultant. Uh, for 18 years before that, I had a very mysterious dark past, which actually has very little to do with that. It has almost everything to do with that. Um, and actually, that's mostly what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's, it's actually a very nice, not pre-planned segue from the section we just had. It's a very definite step on, or continuation, from the wonderful little talk Raymond did, setting up that challenge of you go in and talk to a client or a corporate scenario, you talk improv, what happens? Um, so, uh, because 10 minutes, who knows how much I'll get through, I'm going to tell you my ending, this is it. Uh, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you can sort of guess and work out where I'm heading overall within all this. Uh, but a few months ago, I had to come up with a title, and here it was. So I will also talk about business. I will also talk about murder mysteries, at least briefly. But business is the primary piece. So business, which business? Business is coming in lots of different forms. The one I'm going to talk about is this one, um, Procter & Gamble. My guess is some of you may have even worked for them. Some of you may at least know who they are, and plenty of you may have little or no idea. So to help... This is a much better description of who Procter & Gamble is. Uh, you'll recognise at least some of those brands, or sometimes you'll recognise the shape of the logo but realise the name is different from where you live and shop. And actually, quite a few of you may have even used some of these products between getting up and getting here this morning. Uh, Procter & Gamble is £65 billion pounds worth of business a year. They're doing fine. Makes about the same size as Unilever. About three times, nearly three times the size of L'Oreal. It's a big company. It's not an Apple, it's not a Microsoft, it's not a Volkswagen, it's not a Tesla even, and it's excitement. But it's a big business. Uh, it's 95,000 people around the world. Imagine trying to navigate your way around an organization which is 95,000 people. Um, and the number I always find most interesting is it's 180 years old. There are very, very few companies which are still called the same thing from its formation more than 180 years ago. There are surprisingly few countries which can still call themselves the same thing after 180 years. So, Procter & Gamble, um, we, you know, it's a big business. And why am I talking about it? You can guess, because the dark, mysterious past I had for 18 years was working for Procter & Gamble. Um, I started... In general, sales is the easiest way of talking it. Um, the middle part of my career was shopper and market research, and the latter part of my career was learning and development. Actually, more knowledge systems than training strategy. If you're really interested in that, talk, ask me about it some other time. Um, and as you can see, I got better. These are my opinions on how good I was, rather than anything official. <laughs> so, um, I got better, but I started, and like all of us, to start anyway, I started here not knowing a huge amount. I'm 22 at this point, and across the first few years, I was expected to learn things, and in a big organisation, preferably quickly. And if you, any company has a way of articulating the things they want you to be able to do as a manager, as an employee, but they end up sounding and using lots of the words which we'd recognise, like the ones up there. They were the things I was supposed to get good at, preferably quickly. Um, and the company like P&G does, in some ways a lot, in some ways remarkably little to help you. Uh, in the end, a lot of it is just go learn on the job, get it going. But yes, there's training, yes, there's mentorships, yes, there's coaching. But I learnt also outside of the work, and this is, you can guess where I'm going now, I also learnt outside by doing some of this. Now my assumption is everyone knows what a murder mystery is, but maybe you don't. So, uh, who has no idea what I mean by a murder mystery evening? Ah, okay, cute. Um, who's actually acted professionally in a murder mystery? Okay, that, that, that I was expecting. Okay, murder mystery 101, um, I'll do it from here. So, I used to do it here and in other places. This is the old Swan Hotel in Harrogate. You don't really need to know other than it's in England. What's mildly interesting is this lady, when she went missing, was found there. That's Agatha Christie. A real, um, and that's its front area when you come in. It's lovely and oaky and quaint and pleasant. Um, it's the sort of place which runs murder mystery evenings. Uh, so, very briefly, four to six actors, um, a room of anywhere between 15 and 150 people. Um, they vary exactly how, but in the end, those 
50 to 1,550 people want to be entertained for an evening, and there is a murder mystery. And their main role, in some way, shape, or form, is to solve who done it. Now, in the form we did it in, uh, the guy who ran it was lazy. Uh, so he hired amateurs, hence me doing it, and he didn't really write a script. Actually, he didn't write a script at all. You turned up with a basic idea of the character, um, your relationship with the soon-to-be-deceased, um, some idea why you didn't like them very much, and some bit of evidence which was going to come up against you through the course of the evening. But he had in no way bothered to work out who'd done it. We had to work it out as the actors that went through. So, as a 23, 24-year-old, I don't have to tell you what I learnt, but in the corporate world, I would point be pointing out an awful lot of that stuff. Um, I developed a level of confidence and resilience, a sense of performance and adaptability and agility, which, to be honest, my peers didn't get. There were lots of things they were better than that, but this sort of stuff I became good at, because I did a lot of this. Okay, so, murder mystery is mandated for every business new hire. Great, so what we just do is I can now go to Procter & Gamble and say that. I probably could go to P&G and say that. At least because I've worked there for so long, so I know who to talk to. But in the end, that's not too useful for us. Really, of course, what I'm getting at is, can we go to people and say improv glasses for every business new hire? And yes, you can. And yes, you could. I think maybe yes, we should. But what I want to talk a bit about is, for the final three minutes, is some things to bear in mind when you talk to these people, because they're people. I was one of those people. I was even in L&D. And there's things to bear in mind around how you, they want you to talk to them and what they want in mind. And that's the stuff I'm going to get into. For some of you, you're going to know all of this well beforehand. But let's still explore it. And actually, originally I came with just one thought, but actually I got so interested in the talks over the last few couple of days, I wrote a list of things and have a look at it. And actually, I'm not going to go through all of it. I just want you to run your eye over it initially. Um, these are all thoughts I think are important to us, or things it's worth asking yourself and considering in terms of when you talk to a corporate client. Now, there's one or two I'm going to highlight, but um, actually, over to you guys. Is there anything up there you want to ask me about or get me to talk a bit about? Because that way I can happily fill the time flexibly. So, anybody shout out a number or a phrase? Three. Three. Okay, which one's three? Ah, good. Be easy to categorise. I think actually this is one of the ones I would talk about otherwise. <laughs> you're you're working in an organisation of 95,000 people. It's hard enough working out who the people in your office are and what they do. So, when someone comes to you with I think you should do improv for classes for every new hire. Actually understand the first thing they're doing is, okay, who is this person? And help me categorize, make it easy for me to decide what this is. Is it local? You know, is this, a, is this, just, in, is this just France or is this Europe or is this global? Is it master prestige? Are you sort of, you know, quick and easy and relatively cheap? Are you sort of boutique prestige high end or somewhere between the two? Are you a generalist or a specialist? Are you got, going to give me opportunities for lots of different things, or are you very much specialising in one place? And are you a sole trader, or are you bigger and even part of some multinational? And the thing is, don't be shy about what you are. We, the companies understand you can be lots of different things, and actually there's real advantages at each size. A sole trader is flexible. A sole trader I can pull in and zip out. A sole trader I can phone up and just sort of get into a conversation on. A big organisation, obviously, is great for larger projects in the long term and knowing that if you're ill, it doesn't matter, someone's going to be there. But just tell us, tell them, I'm not them anymore, tell them what you are. So be easy to categorise, be easy to glance at and define what sort of thing you are. Someone shout out one more? Five. That's five, so I'll take five. Oh! How transformational story. Um, We've had some of these. I thought Yannick's story from earlier in the week was wonderful. Someone who can actually come and talk about something they've done personally within that, have something like that, is marvellous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to every man, and everybody looks like. Uh,